Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, on behalf of the World Economic Forum, I'd like to thank you all for joining us uh, for our first ever virtual Sustainable Development Impact Summit. I'd also like to thank you for joining us for this session and your interest in the topic of uh, ESG and corporate mm -hmm. governance. Um, my name is Mahal Tukki. I head the investors uh, industries here at the forum. I also lead our work on the platform of shaping the future of investing. Um, and some of you may have seen that earlier this week, we launched a paper titled Measuring Stakeholder Capitalism, which represented the, uh, or represents the culmination of a year long initiative on identifying universal ESG metrics and disclosures for all companies to report on to um, demonstrate how they generate value over the long term. This was a collaboration with our partners, Bank of America, Deloitte, EY, KPMG, and PwC, and many of our corporate partners, who uh, some of whom are in the, are in this uh, meeting today. We've also been leading a, a collaboration with uh, Baker McKinsey um, on the topic of corporate governance and the future of corporation and how companies are actually taking these ESG principles and other factors and incorporating them into their uh, strategies and operations, which is a big part of what we're talking about or is what we're talking about today. How do we actually take these principles and make them part of our business practices? Um, I am thrilled to have Professor Klaus Schwab with us this morning to introduce the session. Um, before I hand over to him though, I'd like to just do a couple of uh, points on um, housekeeping. This session is being divided in, in two parts. The first part is actually a live stream panel. Um, and then the second part is an interactive discussion. So for those of you who'll be staying with us for the interactive discussion, please, we'd like to, to engage in the conversation and in all the ways that you know, we have learned to do over these past six months um, on Zoom. Um, and then for those of you who will not be staying with us, if you'd like to learn more on the work that we're doing on ESG or governance, uh, you can uh, contact us at esgmetrics at weforum.org. Um, so um, without further ado, I will hand over to Professor Klaus Schwab to introduce us. Thank you very much, uh, Maha. Uh, it's a very important uh, session today because it follows uh, the publication, as you said, of the ESG metrics. And uh, as you have seen, uh, uh, this, um, uh, those metrics were picked up by the media quite substantially. I would like to thank uh, here, um, and I know a number of our IBC members, International Business Council members are, uh, ha have joined us. Uh, it was a great work um, led particularly by Brian Monian uh, and of course for audit companies. And, um, and uh, you, Maha, you, you contributed uh, substantially to it. I just want to remind, uh, to be very short, we, we talk not just about metrics here and adding something to the reporting process. We are talking about the substantial shift which is taking place, which is the transition of an economy which is more based on shareholders' uh, value to an economy which is more based on stakeholder responsibility. And uh, the, the uh, metrics are uh, walking the talk. Um, to add, uh, I would say, a concrete dimension to the stakeholder responsibility. I also uh, would like to mention that uh, this work is part of our Great Reset Initiative. Uh, the World Economic Forum at the moment is mobilizing all its communities um, also in preparation of our annual meeting in uh, 21, uh, related to the definition and design of policies which we have to follow in the post-corona era. Uh, we all know we need uh, to make the world more uh, resilient, more um, inclusive and more sustainable. So the stakeholder concept and particularly the ESGs are a very important part of getting uh, business involved. What I'm particularly proud of uh, in, in the case of um, 
is the development of those ESG metrics is that the initiative came from business, from our 100 plus uh, CEOs. It was not something, um, let's say, imposed on business. Uh, business itself took on the responsibility to, to define how uh, could the um, reporting process and the measuring process and the reporting process structured in a way uh, which gives better, better impression uh, to stakeholder responsibility. Thank you, and uh, I would like now um, uh, to pass on um, uh, the responsibility for our discussion um, uh, to you, Beatrix. Um, so the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Klaus. Um, I'm delighted to be here with all of you today and to add my welcome to all participants to the session. I'm thrilled to have four wonderful speakers with me today who have kindly agreed to share their insights with us. I'll briefly introduce them. Manvinder Vindi, Singh Banga, who's a senior partner at Clayton, De Billier and Rice. Julie Kitcher, who's executive VP at Airbus. Geraldine Matchett, who's co-CEO Royal DSM and Amy Weaver, President and Chief Legal Officer at Salesforce. So as Klaus has said, we've all been hearing the ESG drumbeat that has risen into the boardrooms across our global village. What were once minority voices then turned into market voices. What we are seeing now is that these voices have become market forces. Profit and purpose can be bedfellows. Engaging with your stakeholders is good for business. Measuring and reporting the impacts of stakeholder engagement in a common language and to global standards has become an imperative. You've just heard about progress in this regard uh, announced earlier this week. In this session, we would like to discuss what good stakeholder governance might look like, how boards can ensure that they bring the voice of planet and of society, that is customers, suppliers, employees, communities, right into the boardroom. How can these forces inform a company's purpose and strategy, ensure effective decision-making across the organization? How can shareholder and company interactions become centered on long-term value creation? The need to answer all these how questions has become more urgent as a result of the pandemic. We can all sense that ESG, the importance of taking into account the voice of stakeholders is not a one night wonder. The session is divided into three parts, a panel to discuss practical approaches to stakeholder governance. Then we will break out into Zoom rooms to share and discuss the stakeholder governance journey in our organizations. And then we will regroup and discuss what we learned. But first, we would like to conduct a quick poll to get a sense where the room feels their organization is in the stakeholder governance maturity pathway. So if I could call up the poll, what we would like to ask you is how would you describe your organization's adoption of stakeholder governance and ESG metrics? Is it ad hoc? Is it functionally driven? Is it strategically driven? Or is it culturally driven? And imagine a curve going upwards uh, on each of those. So if you could quickly submit your answers, um, that would be great. Let's see where we come out. I'm looking for the result. Maybe it was a difficult question. Aha, uh -huh. very interesting. Um, good, I guess, because more than half feel it's either strategically driven or culturally driven. Obviously, where we all want to end up is uh, up in, in, that, uh, in that half, ideally in the top quadrant. So now let me turn to our panelists, as there are a couple of questions um, we would like each of you to turn your attention to, in particular from the perspectives of your organizations. The first question I would like to invite the panel to address is, what do you believe are the three essential ingredients for impactful stakeholder governance? And how has a maturing ESG ecosystem affected those beliefs? Amy, may, may I start with you? Sure, I'd be happy to address that. And good morning, everyone from Utah. Uh, delighted to be here today. 
So I think in terms of the three agreement uh, ingredients that have been most critical at Salesforce, the first is really building ESG into our DNA. So when the company was founded in 1999, along with founding a company, they immediately adopted a new way of doing business, which we called 111. And it was a commitment that 1% of the equity, 1% of employee time, and 1% of our products would always go to good causes. Now, there were only four employees. There was no product at that point, and the equity wasn't worth anything. But it was built into our DNA. And 21 years later, that has added up to more than $350 million in grants, 5 million hours of employee volunteer time. And we have over 50,000 nonprofits running on our platform for either free or discounted amounts. And it all comes back to that initial decision to make it part of our DNA. I think over time, the next critical point came around 2015 when we really started using our platform for good and realizing that we could influence social policy, whether that was through uh, standing up for our employees and our community's rights in Indiana in 2015, or taking a stand for corporate taxes to help support homelessness services in San Francisco. More recently, we started accounting, holding ourselves accountable by filing key uh, in performance indicators in our SEC filings and also publishing a stakeholder impact report. I was very excited to see the World Economic Forum endorsing new standards, which I think is going to make it easier for all companies to hold themselves accountable as well. Vindi, may I ask your perspectives from the private equity um, angle? Certainly. Uh, good afternoon, everybody from London. Uh, delighted to be here. Uh, what are the three things that are absolutely crucial? I think the first of those is focus. It's really important to realize that ESG is a long journey. The issues involved are very complex, many, many parties involved, and they require a lot of commitment and consistent effort to drive positive change. And therefore, to make an impact, you have to focus. And the leadership will need to think about the handful of things they're going to pick. Because actually everything, the long list looks great. You want to do everything, but you've got to pick the few things that are really going to drive value for your particular company. Pick them from the point of view of risk, but importantly also pick them from the point of view of opportunity. To the point Klaus just spoke about earlier, we all know that you get what you measure. And therefore, it's really important to pick the few things and then have clear measures. Now, measurement is hard. And I think the recent metrics that have come from the forum will be hugely beneficial to actually pick those few and then measure progress. So that's the first point. Get started. It's a long journey. Pick a few things and keep moving. The second, I would articulate, as try to make sure that ESG is a genuine part of your leadership process. It, it can't be run separately from the real business. It can't be sort of a separate group or a separate department within the company or organization. All the agreed ESG priorities have to be woven completely into the business plan. And if you think about it for a moment, that's obvious, except you don't see it happening in many, many organizations that I come across. If you want to take action across your supply chain, by definition, your procurement people have to do it, not the ESG group. If you want to actually reduce waste and emissions, your product development people, your factories, they're the people who have to get involved and sort it out. If you want to focus on diversity, well, it's got to become part of the selection process. So everyone involved in it has got to understand how to change onboarding, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, it's got to be integrated into the way you run and lead your day-to-day -day company. It's not something you review from time to time at uh, either ESG or board meetings. The third point I would articulate, it truly is culture. Uh, you have to believe that ESG creates value. Now, if you stand back from it, it does. We know that environment, the E part, is about doing more with less. And if you're able to do that, over time, that will surely create value. 
As far as S, the whole point about stakeholders, we know that if your employee is actually happier, that person's gonna be more productive. If the employee force is healthier, they're gonna be more productive. And, and therefore, I think again, there you can see the link between these words, E, S, G, and actual real value creation. Now, how do you build that? You, you build that by leading from the top. You know, the whole organization always watches the leader very carefully and watches the board extremely carefully. So small things make a huge difference around what I've been saying earlier. Is it actually on the agenda at every key leadership meeting? Are the measures we talked about relevant to compensation? Do they, do they matter? Are, are people who are actually genuine believers in ESG and the purpose of the business, do they get rewarded? So culture is built over a long period of time with lots and lots of effort. One mistake can destroy it. So those are my three points, I guess. Focus, making sure it's part of the leadership process and building a ESG culture, a governance, stakeholder governance culture. No, those are great insights, Vindi. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to turn to you, Julie, all the way in Toulouse. How is Airbus facing these challenges? Thank you, Beatrice. It's really a, a pleasure to be here with you today. So over the last six months, um, we at Airbus have obviously been focusing on the uh, navigating the gravest crisis to hit our industry. And we've been doing it in collaboration with our partners, customers, suppliers, governments and others. And I think in so doing, our stakeholder governance has probably taken on a new dimension. Uh, so the three key ingredients, um, which I think have driven really positive outcomes. Firstly, having a shared sense of purpose. Um, Actually, I believe we're very fortunate to have defined our company purpose ahead of the crisis. It's given us a, a North Star um, and an opportunity uh, to, you know, to, to, to pull together um, all towards that, that North Star and focus on what's uh, really important, focus the key priorities for us as a company um, and the role that we play in society and, and it has ESG at the core. And I think especially um, in times of an industry standstill with confinements and travel restrictions, there's really been uh, no better vector than to strengthen our ties across the board via that purpose. Uh, from customers, employees, suppliers, um, policymakers, and, and indeed investors, uh, it, it, it gives us that North Star. So. Um, We've tried to create a shared understanding of the value of our industry and indeed the value that um, our company can bring to society as a whole. Uh, so our purpose is to pioneer sustainable aerospace uh, for a safe and united world. And it really reflects that value uh, aviation and aerospace can bring uh, to society by creating economic progress through connectivity and global trade, which in turn allows us to innovate for ambitious environmental goals and commitments. Um, it brings social progress through connecting people, cultures. Um, it creates lasting friendships and, and resolves conflicts as well. And of course, all within um, a growing framework of governance um, and transparency. The second um, is probably ensuring equal parts of uh, proactivity and collaboration. Um, what do I mean about uh, proactivity and collaboration? Well, probably, again, even more apparent of late, we need to strike the balance uh, between the two to be impactful. As an industry leader, Airbus has the ability to play a leading role in the recovery of aviation, but of course cannot do it alone. Um, for example, the fear of contracting COVID-19 while flying really required us industry-wide to address the specific concerns of our stakeholders, which is why we launched a multilateral cooperation between industry-wide organizations, airlines, governments, stakeholders, um, and leading manufacturers, of course, to keep trust in air travel and restore a safe and timely return to air operations. But again, you can only do that through collaboration. This week, hopefully you saw it, we clearly demonstrated our intent to fulfill our ambition to lead the decarbonisation of the industry 
uh, we announced a bold intent to bring a zero emission aircraft to market by 2035. But we know, however, we'll only do that, we'll only succeed through strong collaboration. Um, and a testimony to that is in the, the strength of the recovery uh, agreements with our European government partners, uh, among many things, which will allow us to accelerate our research efforts in cleaner aviation technology. And probably lastly, so third, the third ingredient is really to build and nurture trust. Um, and in so doing, we focus really on four pillars as a company, quality, safety, integrity, and compliance at the foundation of what we stand for. Uh, and we have a code of, contact, uh, code of conduct, sorry, which is um, deployed company-wide um, and widely recognized as our governance backbone. Um, and furthermore, clear, consistent, and standards-based ESG reporting remains an, an essential ingredient for us with building trust with our stakeholders. So we also follow GRI gu guidelines and regularly publish CDP reports. Thanks, Julie. Those are very um, interesting insights as well. Um, last but not least, um, I'd like to move to you, Geraldine, and um, hear your thoughts on your journey. Thank you, Beatrix. And it's a great pleasure to be part of this amazing conversation at exactly the right time. Um, your question was, what are the three main ingredients? And I have to say, listening to Vindi earlier, um, it's a nice way of linking because at DSM, for those of you who don't know us, we are the world's leading producer of micronutrients and a specialty materials company. And uh, about 10 billion. And just to give you an idea of the journey, um, we will be celebrating uh, our 10th integrated annual report. Um, we were actually uh, reporting on a triple P bottom line 20 years ago. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is for us, the main number one ingredient is leadership from the top on a long-term basis. This cannot be on and off. Um, so my predecessor's predecessor started the journey and we've continued to build ever since uh, on that. Uh, going all the way to having our remuneration uh, being 50% um, linked to ESG uh, and 50% financials. And when we introduced that in 2009, so this was not a new thing, it made the first page of the Financial Times. Now I'm glad that today um, things have moved on, but I think my message is, um, as Wendy was saying, get started, but you have to be consistent and it does take time. Um, so that would be the first ingredient. Um, the second one is actually trust and transparency. So um, we've been a listed company for 30 years. Um, we have more than a hundred year history uh, as a company, but being listed, of course, you learn to earn the trust of your shareholders, but you also need to earn the trust of your stakeholders. Now we are a Dutch listed company. Um, so our articles of incorporation actually require us to take care of all stakeholders. And that is now reflected in the way that we run the business. And it is absolutely true. You need to embed it in everything uh, that you do. Um, partly what I mean trust, it does mean reporting in a consistent, coherent way, and if possible, get reasonable assurance on the quality of your ESG reporting, and the same way as you would have the quality of your financial reporting uh, being validated. So that's the other big component. And if I link to that, um, the third one, unfortunately, isn't in place yet, although I do believe, thanks to the World Economic Forum, amongst others, we're making progress. And that is about having an agreed framework of reporting. Now, we've been very involved with the IBC and others to try and help a convergence around the right reporting matrices. Um, our work has made us identify over 650 ESG uh, matrix um, that are out there. And we are actually ranked one in pretty much all of the ESG rankings that are around. But to get there is currently mm -hmm. a very complicated thing. And it's not helping to be fair, the readers and, and the, neither the investors nor society nor community at large, uh, because it is very eclectic um, and, and therefore it's difficult to follow and it's difficult to really hold companies accountable um, because there's this still very scattered way. So we highly support um, the work that's being done here and how critical it is to bring a convergence and to bring much more systematic approach to ESG reporting going forward. Thank you so much, Geraldine. Also some great insights. I've heard 
comments like in DNA, um, integrated culture, belief that ESG creates value, prioritize, create a shared understanding, industry-wide cooperation, that was great, trust, transparency, a leadership for the long term also tied with uh, remuneration and appropriate incentives. A lot of good pointers there. We're, we're, we're strapped for time, but I would like each of you, if, if you would be willing to just look at what's happening today and how is that impacting uh, your, 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 your future? What steps are you looking now to take in the future, given what we've been living over the past few months? Amy, could we kick, kick, kick off with you again? Sure. I, I think because the focus on stakeholder governance has been so built into our DNA from day one. The recent pandemic and uh, different changes now haven't really shifted our course. But I think what this year has done is really reinforced stakeholder theory. It's shown that our communities and our companies, it, there's a blurred line. Companies don't operate in a vacuum. And I think back to two years ago when Salesforce was very instrumental in supporting a tax that was going to raise um, taxes on large companies. And as I mentioned, to support homelessness. Now, at that time, we were constantly asked, what does a software company, why do we care about homelessness in our city? And I think the answer is even more clear today. We're not in a vacuum. Strong cities, strong communities, strong public education, that benefits all of us. And it leads to a strong company and particularly one that is going to be sustainable and ethical over the long term. All of this comes back to us and that leads to a stronger company. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, I've got a minute for each of you. You're all doing great keeping to your time. So Vindi, what are you thinking you'll be changing or doing looking into the future? Uh, I'd say this, um, all of us, uh, whether we're in the public markets or my, my side, for example, private markets, we're all owners of assets and companies. And this is not something that's only relevant for the public markets. There's often a misconception in private equity firms that we are transient owners and therefore how can we really have an effect on ESG? And I would just like to use this moment to say that I certainly don't believe in that. Our firm doesn't believe in that. We believe that even if we are transient owners, we pick up companies and we make material changes to them in their growth, in their cost structure, in their margin. And we can do exactly the same with their ESG metrics. We can inherit companies at a particular stage of ESG governance. And when we leave them, leave them at a much better place. And I think that's the opportunity for private capital. Incidentally, the private capital in the world today is over 5 trillion and it turns over every five years. So you can imagine the rolling impact that private capital can have on multiple companies as an engine for change. Thanks so much, Wendy. Julie, some concluding thoughts looking into the future? Yeah, thanks. Um, I, think, I think it's um, about harmonization and integration. So I think you know, all stakeholder groups, employees, customers, uh, governments, NGOs, investors, uh, they have much more common and harmonized expectations with regards to ESG matters. Um, and so that also helps um, you know, with, the, with them being really embedded in, uh, in metrics rather than an overlay on top. Uh, and I think it helps to really, you know, really align with respect to decision-making, um, integrating sustainability into the overall company strategy um, and, and management of the company. And so that helps with the acceleration. I mean, on our side, we've um, now created a dedicated sustainability committee at the board of directors le uh, level. Um, like I said, I think we see the convergence now of financial and ESG performance. Um, and to, to give a, a concrete example, we've also embedded uh, sustainability targets and objectives within our top company performance objectives now. Um, and that really helps to focus um, uh, the, you know, the, the mind and energy and create a, a culture of ESG throughout the company and a better understanding of our um, of our external stakeholders as to who we represent as a company. So market forces clearly at play from every direction. Geraldine, we've got literally 30, 40 seconds left, uh, but I don't want to leave you out. <laughs> no, 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 I will make it short. Um, what, what the crisis has shown for us and, and for the whole world is that basically we need nature to survive. 
um, all companies, uh, no matter what our activities. And therefore, embedding what we do around sustainability into everything is the key. Now, the truth is we can only do it a whole, across a whole value chain. And what I would really like to see is a convergence on the matrices, not for the sake of it, not because of it's a better way of looking at a company, but it is also a much better way at connecting all of the different players across a value chain. And in our case, uh, the food systems is in crisis. It's only through an ESG coordinated approach that we will truly be able to improve an end-to-end -end system like the food systems. Excellent. Supply chains, we needed to make sure they were also included. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Amy, Bindi, Julie, and Geraldine for a very insightful um, number of comments you've shared with us.